Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Ukraine continues to fight back against an increasingly vicious and violent assault from Russia, although Kyiv is still standing as we as we record this. Uh, meanwhile, the January 6th committee drops a quasi-bomb last night, in case you, you missed it, filing papers in court suggesting that uh, they have good faith uh, reasons to believe that the former president of the United States might have engaged in felonious activities, that he might have defrauded the country, uh, engaged in obstructive behavior. This is, look, I mean, we're a long way away from having a trial. Uh, We don't even know whether or not uh, the Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, will actually impanel a grand jury, much less uh, issue any charges. And we're a long way away from any kind of a perp walk. But it is, is extremely unusual to have a filing like this in which a former president of the United States is accused of crime. So as I as I wrote in my newsletter this morning, look, don't indulge in any irrational exuberance, but this is a BFD because there is a remote possibility that at some point in the future, Donald Trump will realize that in this country, no one is actually above the law. Meanwhile, the feds get their first guilty plea in a case of seditious conspiracy, uh, one of the Oath Keepers. Again, uh, where is that going to go? We don't know, but it is a major development, a major escalation in the federal prosecution of what happened on January 6th. So we have an awful lot to talk about, and uh, I am delighted uh, to introduce our guest, Rachel Vinman, who is the co-host of the Suburban Women Problem podcast, an activist, senior advisor to Red Wine and Blue, a group organized to push back against book bans, mask opposition, banning discussion of race in public schools. And uh, as you might have also guessed, she's also the wife of uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vinman, a key witness in Trump's first impeachment. And, impeachment. and Rachel Vinman is also a warrior on Twitter. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Charlie. This is quite an honor. I am a big fan of your newsletter um, and also your podcast. It's a a must listen for me every day. So we have so much to talk about. So I I want to devote at least the first 40 minutes of the podcast to talking about dogs. Yes. Okay. I'm here for it. Okay. We we do have this conflict of interest here that, that we're both dog people. And you have two dogs that look remarkably like our dogs, <laughs> my dogs. I am struck yes. by that in every time I see them. I know. It's very funny. And sometimes people will comment on Twitter, why do your dogs look so much like Charlie Sykes' dogs? And I'm like, I, I don't know. But there is a resemblance, I must say. And uh, I also just want to put a little disclaimer here. If I misspeak and say anything crazy, it's because I really have not had much consecutive sleep in the past seven days. So uh, just just putting that out there right here. You know, it's like we have a newborn because both Alex and I are awake every two to three hours checking the the news. And we're both working on initiatives both here and Ukraine. So there's a time difference. So we're, you know, waking up, I think, to check on those kinds of things. So I just just want to put that out there. Hopefully I won't say well, anything incredibly stupid. But Well, that's okay because we can also edit this. But, <laughs> you, you know, I've actually been haunted by some of the images that you've posted mm-hmm. about Ukraine. And obviously both you and your husband, you know, have you know deep ties there. You've, you've lived there. You care deeply about it. You posted – and I, you, you may not even remember this at this point, but you posted a picture. It was, it was like an, an illustration of, of of this hand sort of reaching out of the water like somebody who is drowning. And then this hand, uh, it's Ukraine. And then the hand comes from the sky mm-hmm. and it is it is the West. It is NATO. The first frame looks like NATO is extending the hand to save Ukraine. And then in the next frame, it just gives Ukraine a little like high five mm-hmm. and disappears. And I thought, oh. So, Rachel, is that how you see the state of play right now, that the world is sort of giving Ukraine kind of a high five, but leaving them on their own? You know, I'm not sure that I would say it that way, but that Mm -hmm. image was posted by a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Last, on Saturday, I published an opinion piece in USA Today talking about my friend Karina, who I met in Moscow, but who is Ukrainian, and she and her family have fled Kiev. And she posted that picture. So it wasn't my meme. I think this is what the Ukrainians see and feel. It's the old perception is reality, even if we don't want to see it. 
So that's where we are. I mean, me personally, yeah, I understand NATO as much as I don't like it. I mean, I I, yeah. I posted a tweet in a couple of days ago and saying my head understands and my heart will probably never understand. And that's hard. And I, I live with someone who very much is involved in this, but he thinks about it very cerebrally, not only because he's a man and that's how he approaches most things, but also because he wants to fix it and you have to fix things generally with your head and not your heart, something like this. So I would say it's not necessarily the way I see it, but if that's the way the Ukrainians are seeing it, you know, we need to kind of approach this from all sides and hearts and minds matter on both sides of a conflict of a war. Well, let's talk about where we're at right now. So there are weapons that are flowing into mm-hmm. uh, into Ukraine from the European country, confirmation of hundreds of Stinger missiles at the same time. We're finding out that the number of refugees is now topping a million yeah. Ukrainian refugees. And we are seeing, and I know you've been tweeting about this, the atrocities from this Russian invasion, and we are seeing a growing humanitarian crisis. Give me your sense of, again, what's happening. It seems as if, and this shouldn't come as a surprise, that that the Russians are using the cruelty and the terror as very much part of their strategy right now, just to grind down and uh, destroy the will of the Ukrainian people to resist by Uh, inflicting one horror after another on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's certainly how it seems. And I think that is pretty much their game plan. I don't think maybe that wasn't their game plan from the beginning. They thought they would just come in and seize. That didn't happen. And now it's to plan B. In this plan B, they're also incurring a lot of loss of life. And the humanitarian crisis of Ukrainians is just particularly disheartening. You know, just in the week between when I first started messaging my friend and urging her to leave, Mm. I remember she posted, you know, these stories on Instagram, an update on the apartment that they're renovating, you know, pictures of their family movie pizza night, and they were watching Beauty and the Beast. And these are, they might as well been in, you know, if everything she posted wasn't in Russian, they could be in... Western Europe or in the United States, you would never know a difference. And that has been destroyed. So I guess you say, do you go back and rebuild in Kiev? Or do you just try to make a life somewhere else where things might be a little more stable? So this is just the beginning of the humanitarian crisis and just the beginning of the refugee crisis that Ukraine is going to face. But I will say, Poland has asked for $100 billion to help rebuild Ukraine after this is all over. And that is a promising step. This may seem like an awkward question, but you've lived among them. You Mm -hmm. know them. Who are the Ukrainians that we're seeing? Because I think this is one of the things that has riveted the world, is watching their courage and their determination standing up against the Russians in a very, very distinctive way. So can you just give Mm -hmm. me a sense of, I mean, these are people who have fought for democracy, who have fought for freedom for a very, very long time. But at least Vladimir Putin did not expect that he would meet this kind of resistance. He obviously did not know who the Ukrainians are. So in December, we had a, Alex and I work with Renew Democracy with Gary Kasparov, Mm -hmm. and we had a retreat. And there were some Russia experts who spoke. And one of them was a State Department official speaking in a personal capacity. And I remember him saying, Vladimir Putin hates that Ukrainians even exist. And I remember thinking, that's a really true statement. (laughs) But people still don't even want to admit it because it's just so jarring, right? Just a crazy thing to say. But that's how he feels. The Ukrainian people, you know, they've had a color revolution, they've had other revolutions, and they haven't really stuck. And part of that is, I think, because it's, I mean, it takes a tremendous will for the initial revolution and then to carry it out. And and you have this entire structure that's built around, you know, kind of a post-Soviet space where there's a tremendous amount of graft, of corruption. And they've made amazing strides, but it's still really difficult. And the reason why it's difficult, and again, in my head, I completely understand this, but by not being fully accepted by the West, it makes that challenge a lot more difficult for those who want to have 
less corruption, who want to make a pivot towards the West when they're not fully supported there, it's hard. But the Ukrainian people, as everyone has seen, are beautiful, warm, and caring people. From the very beginning in Kiev Rus, a thousand years ago, they've always had this desire to go towards Europe, while Russia was always a little bit, you know, protectionist, with the exception hmm. of, you know, we have some time around Catherine the Great, and, and you know, there were some intermarriage, uh, of course, with some of the great houses and empires of kingdoms, principalities of Europe, but they still kind of stayed to themselves. Well, Ukraine has always tried to go west. Lviv, which has been talked about a lot in the news, Lviv was at times part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So there are people who have that model and they've seen it and they always wanted it more than ties to Russia proper. And part of that is because Russia has never treated them well. I mean, again, it goes back to Vladimir Putin doesn't even want them to exist. They've always been, you know, like the country cousins. You know, he wants them under his thumb. And Russia in general has always wanted Ukraine under its thumb. And um, there's the famous, I will paraphrase, quote by Zygmunt Brzezinski, that's Russia without Ukraine ceases to be an empire. But mm. Russia with Ukraine subjugated and under their control is immediately an empire. And that's what Vladimir Putin is trying to do. But he'll never subjugate them. That's the thing. He'll never have them completely under his control. How do the Russian people feel about the Ukrainian people? Uh, I am asking this because I'm seeing these pictures of these massive anti-war protests, mm -hmm. which are – they seem remarkable to me. Yeah, Given the legal absolutely. climate right now in Russia, that thousands of people would turn out on the streets of St. Petersburg to protest against this war. Do Russian people see the Ukrainians as cousins? As What's that dynamic? Well, certainly they're fellow Slavs. I think it's a generational thing. So you might have younger people who don't see a difference at all and older people who still have kind of an older mindset, much like in the U.S., a lot of young people don't get their news from state media mm -hmm. in Russia. So they're getting it from other sources, which are more difficult for the Kremlin to control. Now they've just cut off all access to everything, essentially. But that doesn't mean they're turning on state media, right? So that's just not something that they do. So I think their heads have not been filled with this nonsense. And frankly, it's racism. It's all mm -hmm. the just propaganda. So they don't have the hate towards the Ukrainian people. I will say, when I met my friend Karina, I worked at a Russian kindergarten, a private kindergarten, and especially the older people definitely looked down on her, and they would make sort of, I don't know you call it racist, but they would make comments about her being Ukrainian, and they were definitely not good comments. So, you know, when you look at the Soviet Union, it was made up of, you know, states from all over, from the Caucasus and Central Asia. So obviously there's only one true race, that's the Russians, and then everyone else, you know, there's kind of like a pecking order. Ukraine might be at the top of that, but they're still underneath and they're never fully trusted. And so I think you still have a lot of that in Russia today, but you also have a Russian population that's traveled, you know, which in the past More 10 to 15 years. Yeah, right. And so once that genie is out of the bottle, once people go out and they see, oh, okay, well, maybe this is not what I thought it was. And they have that experience. You can't undo it. Well, let's talk about President Zelensky, one of the mm -hmm. most amazing figures, you know, a comedian who played a comedian on television who becomes <laughs> president. I mean, it's just, you can't make it up. It's, no, it's, no, it's crazy. It, it would lend the ultimate simulation. <laughs> For weeks, he was saying, why are you saying this is going to happen? It's, yeah. Everything's okay. It's no big deal. But he's risen to the occasion in such a way that he's being compared very widely to people like uh, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. You obviously are familiar with President Zelensky, and I want to talk about him and, and his relationship with Donald Trump. But give me your sense of President Zelensky, um, the man meeting the moment. Well, it's just been incredible and inspirational to watch. and I don't think I'm alone. And in fact, uh, with the group that I work with, Red, Wine, and Blue, someone posted right now, Every woman in your life has a little bit of a crush on Vladimir Zelensky, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> um, you know, so there you have it. But I remember, like, the Ukrainian election leading up to that was a very big deal. Alex worked at the White House at that time, so I followed it 
And there were a lot of people who thought it was just a joke that he would get the nomination. And a little fun fact, Donald Trump made the comment, are you serious? They're really going to elect a former comedian? And I'm like, oh my, that's just the height of... Ironies. Yeah, I know. I know. Like absolutely no self-awareness whatsoever. As I say, negative levels of self-awareness. But in any event... He has risen to the occasion. I don't really know why he downplayed it so much. I think he was trying to prevent panic in his country. And, you know, there'll be a time to look at that and see what the situation was there. He also didn't call up the reservist till you know, very late in the game. And that very much bothered my husband. In fact, we had an argument one time because he was doing a TV hit. And I thought he went after Zelensky way too hard. Mm -hmm. But I think he had a method. And I think there were just a lot of people who didn't believe that it was going to happen. I think President Zelensky, from what I know, was one of those people. He really Mm. believed that it would not happen. And that was a delegation that went. Alex was not able to go because he uh, had COVID. But the reports from the people who came back were that Zelensky was very much in denial that it was going to happen. Um, But, you know, would it really have mattered? I'm not so sure that it would have. And he tried to reassure his people and mm-hmm. so here we are. But, you know, I, I think that when you see this shift, because you can see the shift with Europe, right, Charlie? Like, you can Thematic. see that they were like, oh, I, we're not going to give them, like, lethal weapons, maybe. Then Germany was like, okay, what do you want? We'll give it to you today. And the reason, I think, is because of Vladimir Zelensky. He didn't leave. I think there was this idea, like, maybe he's just going to turn tail and leave, and then we're going to give him all these weapons, and whose hands are they going to fall into? And other issues, or they would just fall, and the Russians would get them, you know, sorry, they, that Ukraine would just, you know, immediately fall, the Russians would get the weapons. So then we are inspired by someone who says, we're here with you. I'm going to fight with you. I'm not going to leave. And he's a showman, He's used that to his advantage lots of times, and I'm here for it because the world needs to see this. See, this is actually a rather extraordinary point that the example of one individual, the example of one courageous man Mm -hmm. can actually change the foreign policy of a continent, which, again, it seems kind of a – an unfashionable opinion because, of course, you know, individuals don't matter. It's, you know, great matters of state. But I don't have a better explanation for mm-hmm. this dramatic reversal. Okay, so, Rachel, let's dial the tape back a little bit to the time when uh, the former guy was in the White House. You were not an activist. You did not have 250,000 <laughs> Twitter followers back there, right? No. I mean, you were kind of thrust into it. This was one of those <laughs> things. And it strikes me as one of the ironies of history that the first impeachment of Donald Trump was his attempt to extort and bully this man, Mm -hmm. President Zelensky, by withholding lethal aid in order for him to commit this uh, petty, political, dirty trick of digging up dirt on Joe Biden. And of course, your husband, you played a major role in all of this. So give me your sense. There must be a sense of vindication of all of this. Uh, There were a lot of people who thought that perhaps, you know, that had been dropped into the memory hole of history. It seems very, very relevant right now. So Mm -hmm. as you look back on that, do you feel that sense of vindication? Not that you ever Uh, lacked it. (laughs) Well, I do because I've seen a lot of people on Twitter saying, Hmm, I feel like I need Katie Porter to pull out her whiteboard and draw the dots for people. But this goes back. It's everything. It's Ambassador Yovanovitch. It's Mm -hmm. it's all those pieces. And when we were again at that dinner in um, in in December, I was sitting with Ambassador Taylor and Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent, who also testified, and we were talking about this meeting that when Alex came back from the Zelensky inauguration, which was in, I think, like late May of 2019, we were on our way home. I picked him up at the airport and we were on our way home. And then Dr. Fiona Hill called and said, you need to come into the office. So that was because the next day they were supposed to brief the president. And the reports were in that meeting, the president was going on and on about how he hated Ukraine. And he was very negative about Ukraine, saying they're the ones who were you know, doing all this shady stuff against him, which is, you know, I think what he had been told and was the narrative that they were trying to, you know, spin and create. But I often think about that meeting and how 
Alex was told, don't go to it because then this will prevent you from being deposed later. Well, that didn't really work out, but uh, (laughs) uh, it was a little bit more than a deposition in the end. But yes, I mean, I think for so long, I always thought it was interesting with all the testimonies of people during the impeachment was that it took them a long time. And these are smart people, really, really smart people. It took them a long time to figure out what was going on because it was so shady. And it was like this parallel government track. And that's why I think when we're talking about, you know, at the top of the show, you talked about January 6th. At some point, the truth comes out and you see what was actually happening. And, and that's what we're doing now, looking back on, you know, almost two years later on the impeachment and that the extortion call and and you see just how bad it was because you see the importance of how dangerous it what what Trump was doing and and how he was trying to interfere with the country's ability to defend themselves and then i think we're going to look back in 2 years at January 6th and and it's going to be so much more clear i hope that it doesn't take a great tragedy like what we're seeing now in Ukraine for us to realize the depths of this seditious conspiracy. Well, and also it's interesting how many of the cast of characters are the same. Rudy Giuliani, right at the center of yep. the attempt to you know, yes. engage in this corrupt Cash bargain Patel. with Ukraine. I think one of the reasons why the smart people had a hard time figuring it out is I think perhaps there was a failure of imagination just how <laughs> deeply corrupt yes. these people are. I mean, no one wants to believe that the president of the United States and his closest cronies are capable of this kind of mendacity. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I still think that there is a, a failure. Yes. So your thoughts watching the born-again Ukrainian champions, the Elise Stefanics <laughs> of the world, who stand by Ukraine when, in fact, for example, since I mentioned Elise Stefanik, made her reputation by going to the wall to defend Donald Trump's uh, conduct with Ukraine. What are your thoughts about that? As you watch these people scurry to get on the right side of an issue that they had been profoundly wrong on for so long? Well, this is a hard one for me. Alex thinks that we should wait because we need them now. We need them to fight this and we should adjudicate this later. It's, as you know, it's really hard for me to remain silent. The hypocrisy is just incredible. And it's not just the hypocrisy. It's I really see a direct line between them enabling Donald Trump, which enabled Vladimir Putin, which brought us to this moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm a parent, you're a parent. Accountability is something that needs to happen almost immediately. If you're trying to do it much later, no one thinks you're serious. Or dogs also. I mean, you have to do it right in the moment, catch them and say something. Now, I know our legal system doesn't work that quickly, but... For so long, both Putin and Trump, to a lesser extent, but, you know, were enabled. No one gave them actual consequences that touched them. And we we had sanctions on Russia, but that just hurt like the regular Russian people. It didn't hurt anyone else. It didn't hurt his top people. And then I think also with Trump, it's the same thing. So they told him what you did was okay. This is, I mean, first of all, they just dismissed it as being fake, Mm -hmm. which was particularly insulting to me because, you know, as Alex has has said many times, he went to the lawyers to try to just tell them, hey, you might want to tell him not to do this anymore. This is how it looks. Not thinking that it was exactly how it looks, but he kind of was hoping for a private course correction, you know, that they would steer. He's certainly at that time did not see the larger picture of the conspiracy. And Maybe these people didn't also, but it's just finally took the invasion of Ukraine for it to happen. I I, I don't really buy that, but they should at least admit they were wrong so that we can listen to them now. I think they'd rather just um, hope that we will simply forget, (laughs) that Tucker Carlson will just simply flip. And of course, the party line in the MAGA verse and with much of the Republican Party is that this invasion never would have happened when Donald Trump was the president. Oh my president. gosh. So your your reaction to that is like that Donald Trump deterred Vladimir Putin, that it was only when Donald Trump left that Vladimir Putin decided to invade Ukraine. 
my counter to that, when people say this never would have happened under Donald Trump, I was like, you're probably right, because he didn't have to. He had exactly what he wanted. He had a Ukraine that wasn't going towards the West because they wouldn't be allowed to move towards the West. He also had the promise that in the second term, the Trump was going to leave NATO, thus dissolving NATO and making it completely impotent. Yeah. And so he could invade Ukraine without ever having to worry about the West in any way, shape, or form. So why now? As I mentioned, you know, my friend Karina, when I look at her Instagram stories, as opposed to some of my friends in Russia, who are the same age, have children the same age, it's very much clear that they're in Russia. When I look at Karina, it's not the case. Hmm. And the Ukraine, again, it and the people... The government, they just naturally shift towards the West. And it's a constant effort to push them back that Putin is trying to just, I mean, eight years of war to push them back to him. It's like an abuser. Yeah. Well, your point about Donald Trump and NATO seems so important, particularly since uh, Donald Trump, is, I think, is likely to run. Uh, I think mm -hmm. he's likely to get the Republican nomination, at least you know, for now. And there's a chance he will be restored. What happens to NATO then? Because we are having a moment where NATO is reasserting its relevance, really in maybe the most dramatic way that it has since the yeah. end of World War II. And the only way that Vladimir Putin can defeat NATO and restore his position is to have an ally like Donald Trump in the White House. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, we're talking about the failure of imagination before, the failure of people to realize what was going on. Um, how many times does Donald Trump have to say privately or publicly that he disdains NATO, that he's not comfortable with NATO, and that he trusts Vladimir Putin? I mean, how many times does this have to happen before we realize, wait, this is the one guy who might hand the victory to Vladimir Putin long term? I mean, it's mm -hmm. breathtaking when you think about it. And I know that we've been talking about this for years and years and years, but still, what does it take to go, okay? This is who he is. This is the side that he would be on in this conflict. I think those are all plausible scenarios, frighteningly so. And just as people didn't, I think, fully understand the danger of what Trump was trying to do whenever he you know, attempted yeah. to exploit Vladimir Zelensky, it's also difficult to understand what it would mean to dissolve NATO. Because Trump talked about NATO more than any other president in a very long time. But when he talked about it, you would have thought it was a golf club because all he could talk about was how people didn't pay their dues. It's, yeah, it's not, yeah. you don't have to pay your dues to NATO. You're not joining a club. It's a pledge to spend, you know, a percentage of your GDP on defense spending. And you can define defense spending in many, many different ways. So NATO has a narrow definition, but I think they could reasonably go back and redefine it and find that most countries are meeting that requirement. And again, it's not a requirement. It's like a, a, a pledge, you know, if you will. So like, I'm going to pay X amount of my salary to my church. But if you don't do it, it's not like you get kicked out of the church. It doesn't work that way. So he talked about it and dumbed it down and was so just misled people like he did on so many different things. So people now think they understand NATO, but they don't understand it at all. And it's almost worse because they have a false view of what it is. No, it, it isn't your analogy that did he regard it like a golf club and, and our allies as somehow deadbeats who didn't pay their dues or, you know, pay their debts, which of course is again, ironic and projection considering <laughs> that Donald Trump is himself notorious for being a deadbeat who does not pay his bills. So I want to talk a little bit more about you and what you've gone through. And again, I, you know, look, people will say, well, this is Alexander Vindman's wife, but you've carved out a lane for yourself now. And you've written about your political activism and your transformation, how you used to consider yourself a Republican, but you yeah. felt that the Republican Party left you. And, I mean, and you've gone through the experience that a lot of folks have experienced where suddenly you realize that your world is turned upside down. You lose friends, you lose alliances, and you find yourself out here on, on this island. And you, and you wrote about that, right? I mean, you wrote a column about... Mm -hmm how the Republican Party left you, not you leaving the party. What was the trigger for you, other other than obviously what happened with your husband and Donald Trump and the impeachment? Was, it, was there other things as well? I think it was the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford. I've never experienced an assault like she did, but just her bravery 
I don't think anyone would put themselves through what she did. And that was before, you know, my husband testified. And I think that really kind of just really got me thinking. At that point, Alex did work in the White House. And we had a lot of talks about it. I mean, he is a bit more socially liberal coming as an immigrant. And, you know, his his family never took social services, but Hmm. his grandmother did because she was much older and she never, I mean, she was she was old and she couldn't, you know, really learn English and get a job. So I think he saw the benefit of a lot of things that I, growing up in Oklahoma, a very red state, was taught welfare handouts. You know, this was like a hallmark of, you know, how I, I learned and became more of a fiscal conservative based on some of these things. And so really her experience is what really got me thinking. And, you know, I was just disgusted, like a lot of women, I was just disgusted by Trump. I mean, there was, I thought, what are we doing here? And just, it was just a constant drip, drip, drip of just nonsense, which is why we have these people who can, eight days ago, they were praising Putin for his stupid speech that was all lies Eight calling days ago. for war yes yeah, and yeah. now they're like ukraine's biggest champions and they're wearing blue and yellow to the state of the union a couple nights ago so it's just absurd and that's what brought me to the place and then to changing kind of my party allegiance and then you know some of the comments that people say to me are People will say, I follow you on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> and, um, but you know, people will say, it's, I think what they like is that I don't hold back and I no, will don't. say things. I don't. And, and that's pretty much, that's who I've always been. But the thing is, is we really like Zelensky. People liked my husband for speaking out. And why do they like it? Because they're so tired of people just sitting and taking it. And you know, I get a little nervous when they say, you you don't hold back on what you're saying. I'm like, that's what people say about Trump. I hope I'm a little bit more intelligent and thoughtful in it than he is. But we have to have someone to punch back, Charlie, someone to champion, someone who says, I'm going to go something through something hard, but you're not going to break me. Well, it's liberating, isn't it? And I get the sense that you found your voice, you're liberated, you know, it's part of being part of a tribe is you're looking around and going, what am I supposed to say? What are my friends I'm supposed to, you know, not step on these toes. And at a certain point, I think, and I think the reason I'm I'm asking this because I I kind of recognize it, is that it's like, you know what, I'm done with this. I am Mm -hmm. done with this. I'm going to say what I think. I'm I'm going to speak truth about these mm-hmm. things, and 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 I'm I'm really not going to worry about whether or not uh, it's quote unquote offensive to some people. So tell me about the suburban women problem. This is your podcast, mm-hmm. and obviously the suburban women problem is a, is a reference to hey you Republicans uh, and you yes. you have a s- serious suburban women problem, mm-hmm. and you're part of that problem now, aren't you? I am, and so Lindsey Graham famously said before the 2018 midterms, oh, we have a suburban, the Republican Party has a suburban women problem, and they do. You know, the suburb, the suburbs, as Donald Trump, you know, he thinks we're in the 50s, the suburbs, the 50s, and that's not what we are. I mean, the suburbs are, uh, you know, more black women live in the suburbs than in urban areas. And, you know, my suburb is actually a majority minority area and here in Northern Virginia. So, it's not a one size fits all approach and we have to come together and listen to each other. On our podcast, we try to demystify a lot of things. Like one of our first episodes and one of my favorite, we're in season two now, but in season one, we talked to the mom of a trans child. Like I don't have anyone in my life that's the mom of a trans child. Like let's just take this apart and have a conversation like we would at the bus stop, like we would, you know, at the PTA meeting. Like let's, let's just see each other as people. And there was a a large part of my life where I didn't see people for people. I saw them for their actions. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. I think we have to do both. And you define them in wrong ways, but you fail to know or fail to see that they're just people too. I, I often talk about when I was 25, I moved overseas and I realized, oh, wait, People are a lot more alike than they are different. And I think that's a really critical thing. I was just talking about reference to it about Russia. You know, when Russians travel, they realize, uh, wait a second, this is not what we've been taught our whole life. And you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And so it's a progression. I, see, I think this is a really important point uh, that part of tribalized politics, which has now become kind of a cliche, 
is that we do reduce people to, you know, one or two dimensions and mm -hmm. that we lose all the nuance. We lose all the complexity. We lose the fact that people are such an interesting yeah. combination of good and bad and, and insight and dark places. And so, you know, these debates that you have on Twitter, like everyone over there is blank, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. well, no, yeah. it's a little bit more complicated than that. Have you ever met them? Have you ever talked to them? Have you ever interacted with them? As a journalist, I always would remind myself, people are always more interesting than you think they are. You talk to them and you will always be more interesting than they think. Are. The other thing that people forget, and I think it's true of people who become prominent or famous or, you know, politicians. Uh, and I used to do this on my radio show. Just every once in a while, I'll remind people, you understand that these people are not yeah. entities. They are actual human beings. They are real people <laughs> who go to bed you know, at night, call their mothers, worry about going to the dentist, worry about their children, have the same kind of anxieties, because it is easy to dehumanize even people in our culture, much less people who, you know, are, are in a different culture. And of course, the danger is, you know, there are a lot of people who have a deep investment in dehumanizing yeah. other people, making you not think of them as complicated, nuanced individuals. And that's something that we all have to, I think, push back against and fight against all the time. But you're right. It is a critical insight. And, and I think if we're ever going to come out of this, this just hyper partisanship, this everyone in their corners, we're going to have to extend a hand to the other side. We're going to have to see them as humans. I'm going to have to talk to my neighbors that have the young signs, as hard as it is, uh, pointed directly at my house, by the way. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, we're going to have to just make that effort. And that's really hard for me too. So I'm speaking to myself when I say this. Look, I'm not preaching as somebody that has been converted <laughs> because there are simply times when I think out of mental hygiene, you know, I look mm -hmm. at, you know what, I don't, I'm not going to interact with that person. Yes. Yeah. No, uh, right. You know, I mean, there, there are people who are just wrong or misinformed. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. deal with them, but then there's a gr group of people who are either just completely lost in conspiracy theories and whatever. And then there are people who just deal in bad faith. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. just they, you can Absolutely. deal with the people who are wrong, but the bad faith argumentation, which, by the way, there's actually a lot of that on Twitter, <laughs> it is not worth your time. So on the suburban women problem, I know that you've talked about this. One of the things that is amazing to me, and I grew up in the suburbs, so I'm a suburban, not woman, but I'm a, I'm a suburban. I, you mentioned throwback to the 1950s. It does feel like, like a scene from an old movie watching these school board meetings that are debating yeah. whether they're banning books. I it's mean, this heavy. is something like we used to experience, and yet apparently we've decided that this is the moment in American culture where we are going to debate what books should be in libraries. That's extraordinary, isn't it? It's amazing. I cannot believe we are in this place. I say that yeah. very often. And... A few weeks ago, I don't even know if I've talked about this publicly. A few weeks ago, one of my co-hosts sent a comment that she received on Twitter. And I saw it and I thought, I, I just saw the picture of the person. And I'm like, I know her. And it was someone with whom at one point I was extremely close in my life. Mm -hmm. And she was calling us out individually. She is a very religious person. She was always homeschooled, her children are homeschooled. And it maybe didn't surprise me that she had bought into it. I would say she's certainly the demographic who would be ripe to buy into a lot of this misinformation and, you know, latch onto it. But I couldn't believe the way she was talking. That really did surprise me. And not surprise me, it shocked me. The more I thought about it, it wasn't surprising at all. Because I just think there's this entire group of people who are being used. And I also think there's tremendous opportunity to have dialogue with people who I still believe she has a good heart and good intentions. So when she's talking about these books that, you know, that she wants banned and doesn't want, by the way, her children are homeschooled. I just want to mm -hmm. reiterate that. Right. It's because she's trying to protect children. And trying to protect other people's children. And it's insane, but so many people, I've been to the school board meetings, I've seen them. They 100% believe they're doing mm -hmm. the right thing. It is right. not the evil. And right. when I see Elise Stefanik, 
when I see Kevin McCarthy, they're absolutely, they're smart people. They're trying to manipulate others for their own gain. That is the tragedy. I mean, you have these completely disingenuous hypocrites Mm -hmm. who then manipulate people who, you know, frankly, do want to do the right thing and are good people. And had the world been different, they would have been on the side of a virtue and Mm -hmm. and improvement Mm -hmm. and tolerance and openness and all of these Mm -hmm. things. But uh, you're also describing the phenomenon that we've uh, we've called in the past the invasion of the body snatchers. Yes, yeah. Where people who you've known for years and years and years, and suddenly it's like, whoa, they got you too. And it mm-hmm. is amazing, and it continues to be shocking. After all of these years, I would say that two or three times a week, my wife and I have this conversation. Did you hear about this person? Oh my God, they got them too. Never would have imagined that this person would be saying this kind of thing. I hope Ron Johnson is one of those people that you talk about. Oh, that, but that was a long time ago. Yes. So here in Wisconsin, it's a target rich environment. I mean, it's like, it's like wherever you go. And some of it is the incentive structure. And some of it is just, you know, the, the cynical, I have to say this in order to be viable, in order to be part of it. And some of it is, I don't know, they've been drinking deep from, you know, the Kool-Aid of crazy. And uh, mm-hmm. it's hard to say, but that's something we have to cope with. And hopefully there are people who will be more tolerant than I am, who will say, okay, we need to keep the lines of communication open. (laughs) It's hard. It is really hard. I mean, and and, you know, I'm kind of a lightning rod because of my name and I guess my public persona now. And, and Alex always says, I can talk to anyone as long as they don't recognize me. And it's true. He's, he's (laughs) an amazing, he can go and speak to people, but if they do recognize him, sometimes it can be difficult. That's why I really encourage others who don't have that place to extend that you, you know, that, that hand to friendship and just have that dialogue. And, you know, from our podcast, we try to give people a bite-sized, relatable talking points and educate them to the point where they can have hard conversations with their friends and they can discuss these things. And, you know, we can go from there, but it's just a place to start. And you might not change their mind right then, but my mind was not changed immediately during the Kavanaugh hearings. But there was something that was placed there that made me start to think mm-hmm. and start to to go in a different direction and and question a lot of the things that I had never questioned before. Um, I, is it Kierkegaard? I don't know who said the unexamined life is not worth living, and I think that's also true with uh, any kind of you know closely held belief, um, what politics, policy, whatever the case may be. I think that was either Socrates or Groucho Oh, Socrates. Marx. Okay. I'm totally sure. possible. Yeah. Or Oprah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think that's true. You know, you see these stuff and you see the MAGA people and they think like, when did you really think about this? And I, I'm not saying that to be critical. I mostly not, but I do think like, when did you stop and think about if I believe this, what does it mean to the person that lives across the street from me? What does it mean to the child in school who's questioning their sexuality or their gender? I've never experienced those things. So I don't know what that's like, but maybe they have some anxiety and depression, which we know is a huge issue for young people today. Just because I didn't experience it doesn't mean that I don't want my daughter to be able to find a character in a book with whom she identifies so she feels less isolated and less alone. Well, I think the isolation and the aloneness is part of this problem. You know, you ask, you know, do they ever think how, what does this mean for that other person? Well, you know, in the silo they live in or the bubble they live in, whatever analogy you want to use, they don't encounter that. They don't have Mm -hmm. to deal with that. And that's why a lot of this happens, I think, is because, you know, we have become so segmented. Rachel Vindman, thank you so much. Now, the podcast is The Suburban Women Problem, which you can find anywhere they have podcasts. And, of course, Rachel is all over Twitter, <laughs> as I am as as well. Rachel, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. This is really an honor. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow. And we'll do this all over again.
Hey, it's Rich Eisen. And my first guest of season three of Just Getting Started happens to be the new host of this podcast, my better half, Susie Schuster. You've got one of the most unique stories of how you got started. So why don't you come across the hall and take the chair and... Oh boy, wait a minute. I think I, I locked the door. That's not a metaphor for anything. How's the lighting in here? I mean, I'm vain, you know? So I thought for the first season, try to bring you people I thought were diverse and different and maybe interesting. And that's why I started off with Jeffrey Ross, the comedian. And then, you know, we've got a bunch of other asks out. Making Paul Rudd do it. Sorry, Paul, do you know that you're doing it? And I want this to be inspirational. Life is really hard right now. And sometimes you just need a little bit of help. Someone to reach out their hand and pull you along or to push you from behind and say, you can do this. And I'm hoping that's what you're going to get from Just Getting Started. Go follow Just Getting Started wherever you get your favorite shows.